Hello and welcome to World Insight with me, Tian Wei, coming to you from Beijing on CGTN. Coming up on today's program, Chinese Premier Li Keqiang attended the Lansang Mekong Cooperation Leaders Meeting in Cambodia. Can this mechanism satisfy the environmental and economic needs of everyone living along this transnational river? Later, I spoke to tech guru Kai Fu Li about the future of artificial intelligence or AI. He explains how humans can embrace AI and bring the job market. We begin today's program in Cambodia, where the second the Lantang Mekong River Cooperation Leaders Meeting has wrapped up in Phnom Penh. Chinese Premier Li Keqiang attended the two-day meeting during his official visit to Cambodia. He calls for strong China-Cambodia ties and Lantang Mekong cooperation. Sustainability and peace are the twin themes at this year's meeting for those trying to manage Southeast Asia's most coveted waterway. At more than four and a half thousand kilometers long, the Mekong is the biggest river in Southeast Asia and the most controversial. Governments build dams to harness its hydropower and produce electricity. They say dams control the water, preventing flood or drought. China opened a dam in 2016 when Vietnam was desperately short of water. But environmentalists claim they can interfere with fish stocks on which millions downstream depend for food and reduce flow needed to irrigate the rice fields. Managing these competing demands is a difficult job, but it's one that this organization, the Lanchang Mekong Cooperation, is tackling head on. Many say great progress has been made in only a short time. Looking to develop growing cooperation between Mekong nations is the Chinese Premier Li Keqiang. He's leading discussions here in partnership with Cambodian Prime Minister Hun Sen. Government leaders from the remaining four nations are also attending. In 2017, Chinese investment in countries along the Lantang Mekong River increased by 20%. Bilateral trade increased by 16 percent, and personnel exchanges increased by about 80 percent. This mechanism is pushing cooperation to a new level. Uh, Mekong and Lantan River, we so call like uh, the river for peace and for is, I mean, uh, a sustainability growth uh, as well as the economies. The LMC is the only body that includes all six countries the Mekong flows through: China, Myanmar, Thailand. Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. My view is that we need to focus on developing the river with a sense of responsibility and sustainability, taking into account the needs of each country. After a little more than two years of operation, the LMC created by China has already brought Mekong countries closer together. After little more than two years of operation, the LMC created by China has already brought Mekong countries closer together. Reaching consensus is a key aim, and a contentious move to dynamite rocks to clear a route for shipping has been put on hold whilst more investigations take place. Martin Lowe, CGTN, Phnom Penh. For more on the second Lantang Mekong River Cooperation Leaders Meeting, we are joined in our Beijing studio, Miss He Wenping, Professor at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Welcome to our program, ma'am. And also, we are joined in Singapore, Mr. Lin Tem Wai, a junk research fellow at the National University of Singapore. Also joining us in Hong Kong, we have Dr. Ruben Mondeja, who is a professor for China Globalization at the IESE Business School from the University of Navarre. Welcome to the three of you. I want to start with you, Mr. Lim, about the assessment. Results? Any achievements? Do we see any concrete plan from this year's meeting? I think uh, we see a greater institutionalization because uh, there was a formation of working groups and uh, also committees. And also we see some uh, proposals uh, being put forward, such as the sharing of uh, uh, water yeah. uh, during uh, seasons of drought, uh, during seasons of uh, rain, 
So I think there are some concrete uh, proposal that's being uh, forwarded. And of course, overall, there is also a uh, familiarity uh, factor where uh, China and ASEAN uh, will uh, be... Uh, China with ASEAN countries in the Lanchang region will be able to know each other better. All right. So I think those are some of the uh, so-called uh, achievements made. But Mr. Maldeja, I mean, people are asking, will these baby steps really going to help us to achieve the, a bigger goal of uh, regionalization? Uh, of course, uh, I think the key words here are cooperation. And the China has taken a very big uh, proactive step to coordinate the different countries. And also what will happen to the you know, different parts of the river. So the, w what is very important here is for China to explain uh, what they are doing upriver uh, to those who are low river countries, uh. so below the Mekong. So Do you think China explained it well? Because this can easily become a source of conflict. I think this is the, this is the challenge. The fact that the, the Premier Li Keqiang w went there, I think, is already a big step. In other words, what we have to avoid is this will be a repeat of something like a, a conflict, uh, something like to be seen as if it's, there is mm. a stiff competition between the use of the river. So I think if they, if they can all uh, be on the same page, and th this big step that I think the premier of, of China, Li Keqiang, going there and trying to explain to the different countries right. uh, what China has done up front, up river, yeah. is that's a very good step. Ms. He, of course, the Asians in you know, our culture are all very indirect in a way. We're very polite in our way of saying things. But Mr. Maldeja did mention a very important point, which is what about peacemaking mechanism? How to make sure a relatively large country like China would coexist peacefully and bring more benefits together with the work from the others to this region? That is the question. Yeah, uh, China is now the big, uh, second biggest economy and comparing with other those uh, five countries within this Mekong, uh, this mechanism, of course, uh, what China has been doing will, will naturally have uh, some spillover effect in other countries. So that's why China now put forward this One Belt, One Road initiative. We would like to share our development experiences and also even our foreign exchange reserve to do more investment mm -hmm. in other countries like infrastructure building, those connectivities. So when we look back those past two years, this mechanism, mm -hmm. actually we have achieved a lot of the early uh, fruit uh, results. For example, uh, I read just uh, a figure saying China-Cambodia uh, cooperation. Um, uh, as many as like 50% of those uh, big main roads in Cambodia has been built by China's mm. uh, help. So that's a very amazing. And also China serving as the biggest trade partner and also now becoming the biggest investors mm. in those countries. So which means now a big brother would like to help All those right. yeah, younger brothers and then to reach this common development. Whether China calls itself Big Brother, I'm not very sure about that, Ms. He, but <laughs> let's go to Mr. Lim and Mr. Monteja because they are coming from different countries. One is from, Singap from Singapore, the other is from the Philippines. They probably have a different ways of looking at things. And Mr. Lim particularly coming from Singapore, which is quite an influential country, I would say, in the region, even though geographically it is quite small. It is also one of the so-called traditional allies of the United States in the region. We see Singapore-China relations have been going ups and downs over the past few years. So I'm sure Mr. Lin see it from a different perspective. Mr. Lin, has China done that job explanation well? And do you think not only explanation, but rather real work, can countries work together in order to achieve, Mr. Lin? I think uh, what you said is very relevant because if you look at ASEAN, or Southeast Asia is actually divided into two big spheres. The first big sphere is maritime uh, Southeast Asia, of which uh, Singapore is also part of, and the other one is overland Southeast Asia, which is Indochina and also Peninsular Ma uh, Malaysia. So I think uh, if uh, China improves its relationship with uh, the Indochinese uh, country, or sometimes called uh, CLMV plus uh, Thailand, right. uh, Cambodia, Laos, uh, Myanmar and Vietnam, then I think uh, China will be able to reach out to almost half of the uh, ASEAN membership. And I think this uh, is what uh, 
uh, they are trying to achieve when it comes to uh, being able to help out in infrastructural development and uh, connectivity. And in this sense, uh, there is accent on uh, three very important resources uh, in uh, the Mekong uh, as well as uh, the Lanchang uh, uh, region, That's right. uh, cooperation region. And these three resources are number one, fisheries. In the downstream, there's actually a lot of fishes uh, and many uh, families uh, in the downstream area depend on fisheries uh, for their livelihoods. Mm. There is also uh, the um, uh, uh, resource of uh, hydropower and uh, China is uh, probably through a Belt and Road Initiative is trying to uh, contribute to this uh, infrastructural uh, area uh, of uh, the uh, Lanchang uh, uh, Mekong cooperation area. And the third one uh, would be actually water itself. Water is essential to life yes. and uh, China is trying to uh, work with uh, some of these uh, countries upstream and downstream. It's located in the upstream. The Lanchang Mekong is about 5,000 kilometers. China accounts for 1% uh, of the Lanchang uh, River and if you add in the Mekong River is about 4%. So there's a lot of potential for uh, China, to, China to cooperate with the downstream uh, so-called economies mm. and uh, countries. So I think uh, this is gradually what it's trying to reach out and, and do uh, with this uh, uh, Lanchang uh, Mekong cooperation uh, uh, um, scheme and uh, initiative. Right. So uh, of course there are many challenges, uh, but this is a good start. Yeah. This is a good start. We hope it is, uh, Mr. Malaja. Of course, uh, in the Lantang Mekong River area, we see some of the least developed economies, developing economies. And also, we've seen a very big wealth gap among countries. And that is one of those cases we have in this part of the world. So how will this, how people are interacting with one another, countries are looking for common national interests together, be able to help us to provide an interesting case study also for the rest of the world and certainly for the rest of Asia. Well, if there is friendship among the different countries, then it's easy to understand the intentions of, of each one. If there is no friendship, then the one that, that comes immediately is suspicion. Mm. So one is trying to, you know, lord over the others. So, you know, this, the first uh, association that talked about this, uh, this uh, Mekong River project began in 1992 with the ADB. And look at that, from 1992 to now, 2018, and we still are talking. So it mm. means that really the friendship among the different countries involved in the river, have, it really hasn't uh, reached uh, a satisfactory level. So this is, I think, the, bi the biggest challenge that we have. Let us first establish confidence building measures mm. so that the suspicion uh, disappears, so that China is not suspected of you know, trying to to use its weight mm. over the other other countries, and mm. then that when China says something, that there is really a belief that there is um, a good goal that uh, is being put forward. Right. And then they have to understand that you know, if this if the river is well, then everyone is happy. You see, we are coming back to the very original point made by Mr. Lim at the very beginning of our discussion, which is the baby steps. When we talk about confidence building, when we talk about friendship, it does begin with the baby steps. So, uh, Ms. He, yet the question is, will the speed of establishing confidence, building friendship, really catch up with the urgent need of having one another's backs when emergencies emerge. I think that is the question because the world is changing faster with its own now and this region is really experiencing something that has never been before. Yeah, that's why now uh, this second, uh, uh, you know, the uh, leaders meeting now put forward moving from a baby step now to the glowing. Uh, now a growing speed, no longer like a, a very small step forward. Now, right now from uh, three uh, pillars, that is the mutual political trust 
and economic cooperation, and also social and cultural interaction. And within those three uh, big uh, pillars, and then there are five areas. One of the areas is called the anti-poverty issue. That's exactly fit with the uh, previous points we just discussed. Uh, because uh, even in China, even though we have developed ourselves uh, in a very good way, becoming second biggest economy, actually we are still have uh, quite a lot of uh, people living under the poverty line. That's why uh, Chinese mm. President Xi Jinping is saying the anti-poverty issue, like a target, uh, you know, target anti-poverty strategy, still is the is the very pre priority thing uh, for all levels Chinese leaders uh, to uh, to you know to strike right. for. So that's why in uh, Cambodia, in those uh, Mekong Nanchan, you know, uh, cooperation mechanism. So we are help to uh, other countries to do this anti-poverty issue, mm. to share our experiences. So those kind of issues can, I think, uh, dramatically uh, to uh, reduce the so-called suspicions. Mm. This is also one of those functions of South-South cooperation, right, Ms. Mondeja? Uh, people talk about South-South cooperation, but exactly how to do it? What is the best way to do it? What are some of the experiences? What are some of the lessons we should learn? We don't have very ready examples. This could be an interesting process of exploring all those questions, Ms. Mondeja. Yes, uh, you know, f for example, it's said that the, this, the river Mi Mekong is the second richest in uh, biodiversity in, mm. in terms of fish species. So, for example, China probably can, can give more uh, help in terms of how the Yangtze and the Yellow River were, were kind of taken care of. So because these are the two long rivers uh, that are within China mm. could serve as, as like a model of how to preserve a river and how, because people are talking about sustainability, right. that they have to, to protect the, the river. So then who is the model? What, what is can the model? we get? Yeah, what can you get? But just yeah. to be frank here, uh, Mr. Mondeja and also Ms. He, I want you to respond to that. China has both experiences and a lot of lessons as well when it comes to the protecting of the rivers and the qualities of the water. Uh, for example, pollution was hunting on the head of China for quite some time. Now the country is really determined to work on sustainability and it needs a strenuous efforts every day. Ms. He, do you think that could be an encouraging sign for China to be even bolder in terms of making efforts about sustainability when it comes to also China's sharing experiences and also lessons with the other countries in our neighborhood? Yeah, of course, not only those experiences and also the lessons, both can be regarded as uh, some kind of value things. Uh, we can help other countries to get a uh, avoid of those repeating the same mistakes that we have made. So actually, like our colleagues mentioned, we have like a, a Yellow River and a Yangtze River, all those longest rivers, we have uh, abundant experience how to handle, like those when the flood season and the drought season, how to make full use of those water resources. Mm. So also, uh, like a, a Yellow River, I think it's becoming dry in some seasons. I passed that river uh, for a number of times, sometimes I couldn't see any. Uh, rivers go in there, it's completely drought. Mm. And also flooding issue, we have uh, gone through a lot of uh, bad experiences when those uh, flood right. season is on. So uh, actually I think uh, with this uh, Mekong and uh, also the Langchang River, I think there's one river and gone through six countries. So actually the six countries, they all have different experience for how to uh, manage, how to uh, deal with those challenges. Right. Not only China's experience, this is a two-way street. Right. Uh, Mr. Lim, those are beautiful examples set by the other two panelists. But, you know, at the end of the day, we all understand it's not just the development. It is also about the strategic future that we are talking about here. When China and some of the neighbor countries, for example, along the Lanchang, uh, Yang, uh, Lanchang River and also the Mekong River are working hard, some of the others could get also suspicious, particularly those that have been playing quite a significant role. For example, Singapore. Uh, Mr. Lim, you know, on that note, what are some of the food for thought you would like to share with us? I think uh, the, uh, what the speakers mentioned is very important, that the Chinese uh, have uh, lessons uh, both in terms of innovations, 
uh, that they have done uh, in especially the Chinese uh, methodology for scientific water management and also some of the pitfalls they have uh, faced uh, over uh, the decades and, and in their experience. I think those are very important. Mm. But beyond that also, uh, China herself uh, has learned uh, from other countries' uh, experience. Uh, officials, for example, from China have mentioned about the 1961 uh, water agreement between Canada and the US and how they signed a, a water agreement that helps them apportion uh, the uh, water use uh, in common uh, water bodies uh, between the two countries. And this actually helps to reduce the tensions uh, and possible conflicts uh, between the two over water resources. So there are also best practices uh, in the world that uh, China has referred to and absorbed uh, in uh, the experience uh, of uh, water management. And all these examples of uh, water uh, conflict uh, uh, mitigation and avoidance uh, would be helpful uh, to uh, China as well as for China to share uh, with uh, other countries as well. So it's not just so, sort of uh, restricted uh, to Chinese uh, examples. Mm -hmm. And in this sense, it would also help to reach out to other uh, stakeholders uh, and best practices uh, in uh, water management mm. around the world. Right. Even though it is about water management, even though it's about how to avoid natural disasters, things are beginning from these kinds of cooperations. Confidence could be built, we hope, with this mechanism. And for now, I want to thank the three of you for being with us. He Wenping, Lin Tem Wai, and Ruben Montage. Thank you so much for being with us. And you're watching World Insight with me, coming to you from Beijing on CGTN. Further on our program, I spoke to tech guru Kai Fu Li about the future of AI. He assures us that there's nothing to fear from AI. Welcome back. You're watching World Insight with me, Tian Wei, coming to you Monday to Friday on CGTN. The annual Consumer Electronics Show, or CES Tech Show, is underway in Las Vegas. We've been reporting about it over the past few days. It's attracting eyes and ears from around the world with some of the planet's most innovative technology and ideas. For example, artificial intelligence, or AI as we know. But compared to all its novel triumphs over humans, how far is it? from becoming an indispensable part of our lives. To answer that important question, earlier I went to Kai Fu Li, the founder of Sinovation Venture, a strong advocate of AI. Over the past few decades, he has been China's CEO of Google and an independent venture capitalist. But he has also spiced up his career with on and off work on artificial intelligence, mentoring of young entrepreneurs, and maintaining a social media presence of over 50 million followers in China alone. Visiting his office in Beijing can boost one's confidence in the potential of AI as he explains how AI has tapped into his ongoing project. A lot of these are AI-based investments. Mm -hmm. For example, Xiaoyu is a product yeah. that's basically a home robot. And a lot of colorful stuff. Yeah, this is a. Uh, this will in the future also have voice interface. It's a um, uh, levitating speaker. Isn't oh. that cool? It's, uh, it's got that's a kind really of robot cool. look. Yeah. It doesn't really move yet. You can see Amazon Echo going into this kind of scenario, oh. right? And yeah. it, this has a. Uh, yeah, uh, it's flying. There's not, nothing connected. It is. It is. And this one is really cute. Well, this what is, is a about? this is a toy. So it's a little toy that you can program. It's yeah. very good for teaching kids about AI. How to so you, how to do that? Uh, well, I, you can use a phone to uh, control it. Yeah. Tell teach you to play a song yeah. by after you. The new version of this can actually play basketball. It can throw throw balls, and you can program it to move forward throw a ball and have two robots play against each other. So all I need is this on the table? Uh, could be life. anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's more for kids, for kids to learn by AI, right? So education. As a venture capitalist, the Dr. Lee is passionate about artificial intelligence, but as a journalist, I need to look past the novel and lighthearted games AI and humans have played and ask him some fundamental questions, of course related to our future with this technology. It seems that Dr. Lee also agrees that we'd better see a bigger picture. For games, 
Uh, there's uh, the, the best people in the world cannot be the AI. Mm. But I think it's time to move on to the real business applications where there's a uh, um, direct business value that's being created. Mm -hmm. So in financial applications, in uh, robotic applications, in medical applications, I think AI is going to blossom and create a lot of value. And, and that's what we should really focus on. Uh, in the next 10 to 15 years, it should easily replace 50% of human uh, jobs and human That's exactly what I want to follow up with. I yeah. know you are a much more into science than I am, which is liberal arts, but uh -huh. still you have to help us understand where yeah. does your number come from, 50% of the job, because you've been talking about this yeah. all over the world. Okay, so Oxford University did a study over the 7,000 job categories in the world, and, and they, they did an extrapolation of to what degree AI can replace those jobs and they decompose the jobs into parts of the jobs. So for example, loan officer is one example, someone who determines to lend the money to you or not. Right. An assistant will have many components, uh, a receptionist, uh, and um, accountant, a paralegal, a reporter. So they took many components of those jobs and they aggregated what percentage of those jobs are repetitive, are possible to collect big data, and it's possible for the big data driven AI to be better than person. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the cognitive part of replacing humans, right? It goes all the way from the jobs I mentioned all the way up to radiologists, right. uh, which could be partially replaced. And then they did uh, a percentage of people whose jobs or percentages of whose jobs could be re replaced. So it has real numerical basis. And then there is the manual labor replacement, which is actually probably a little bit larger than the um, cognitive uh, replacement. Give me some examples. So driver, yep. factory floor worker, construction worker, uh, repairman uh, are the manual labor that uh, are projected to be replaced. Uh, the first ones will actually be probably be uh, assembly line factory worker, right? People who are stationary in nature and just putting things together not very skilled. Mm -hmm. uh, the second type would be the construction worker. On the internet you can see um, robots that lay bricks much better than people. So it's not every type of construction may be the ones that require modest level of right. uh, dexterity. Uh, and then you go on to um, drivers. Right? Drivers alone are close to 10 percent of the world's population. So when autonomous vehicle takes off basically all the drivers will be, be replaced. So that's where the 50% come from? So they're adding up, yeah, a few percent at a time, uh, total about 50%. The reason to be optimistic is that each such AI replacing a human is creating a huge economic value mm -hmm. and technological progress. And I think very few governments and corporations can resist the temptation to let its technology race ahead mm. and, uh, and to reap the reward from the economic value being created. But come on, Kefu, I mean, you were in AI research back yep. in the 1980s, beginning right. from that period of time. Yep. You've seen these ups and downs, and people are excited, mm. overexcited, and mm. then uh, over uh, pessimistic about mm. the whole thing. And this, again, this yeah. time, is this yesterday once more? Uh, I don't think so. No, Be not really? Because back in my PhD days, the algorithms were not nearly good enough. Mm -hmm. The amount of data we have was not nearly good enough. The computers were not fast enough. And, uh, and also, as a result, I and my colleagues never made such projections. <laughs> right? So this is the first time. Okay, that, I can uh, testify to that. Yeah, that's right. right. You've <laughs> interviewed me. the very me. first time. That's right. The first time we're making those projections. On the mm -hmm. one hand, we mm -hmm. all know, quote unquote, this wolf. Mm. can be good, can be bad mm -hmm. in different ways, right. it's coming, yep. and yet we are not really preparing for it. What do we do about the replaced, displaced people? What do we do about um, education? Uh, and uh, how do we uh, uh, narrow the gap between the haves and have-nots? Mm. How do we prevent the successful AI companies from becoming too powerful and too rich? Whose job is it to think about all these questions you just raised? Is that your job, Kai Fu? I think all of us have to mm. play our part. Science Innovation Ventures, yeah. the thing that you're doing, has a lot right. to do with the future development of technology. So you're certainly coming at it from a business and venture capitalist perspective. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you from that perspective. Okay. Will there be too much concentration of data 
mm. too much concentration of access to data mm. and privacy and information mm -hmm. from the business? Well, the businesses that have a lot of data will gather even more data. I'd, I, I'd like to think they're behaving reasonably, but I think the best way to check, uh, to provide checks and balances for them is to encourage much greater uh, competition to have, you know, a hundred or a thousand companies like them mm. competing for users with them and providing solutions with them and each with its access to a certain amount of data but not giving any one company But these are unicorns. I mean, it's very hard to rival against them because they have enjoyed quite a golden period of time mm -hmm. over the other future competitors. Is it ever possible to create this competition? You said yourself five to ten years. Is it ever possible? Well, the worst case is uh, they may become dominant and mm. then antitrust laws may have to come in to check them. The other thing is the access to information for the public to understand mm. about the technologies. Yeah. Well, first, I don't personally own any <laughs> of your information. <laughs> I'm not by do or ten cents. No. Um, but um, I, I think users do need a certain degree of uh, knowledge as to how much privacy they're giving away for convenience. Mm. I mean, the, the game today that is being played is these internet giants are taking all of your privacy information mm. and hopefully keep, keeping it uh, 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 from give, getting out. And I think they're doing a decent job at it. Mm. We don't read about too many leakages. And they're providing you great convenience, right? So when you go on Taobao, the things you see are things you actually want to buy. When you go on uh, Tencent, you have uh, ease of interacting with your uh, network of friends. So it's currently, the current model that's working in China, U.S., and anywhere is a model of implied trust, yes. where I, as a user, give up my private information to the gi internet giants, and in exchange, I get convenience, and so far, they haven't um, done anything to lose my trust. That is a fragile balance, and, mm -hmm. and I hope there are more uh, laws and media and checks and balances and competition that will keep it that way. But you know, Katu, the question really should be, how can we let AI to work with us? Yes, that's a very good point too. As an assistance, yeah. as a tool, yeah. rather than let it dominate what we will already have and right. what we will have in the future. How much has yeah. effort been put into that category? I think there are some big opportunities there. But I, I don't want to be too optimistic <laughs> because AI will uh, improve rapidly with more data. So let's take doctors. Let's take um, cancer diagnosis as an example, mm. right? Um, let's say a doctor for a particular type of, let's say, lung cancer can uh, properly identify and save, let's say, hypothetically, 70 out of 100 patients, right. okay? And let's say the first AI tool that comes out probably won't be that good. Maybe it will save uh, 50. But the doctor using that tool together maybe can save uh, 73. So that's three more persons saved thanks to the tool. Mm -hmm. But if we move time forward another five years, that same tool or a better tool with more data may be able to save 80 lives. That's right. Now the doctor has to work hard to together working with the tool save maybe 83. So that three extra lives is the value the doctor has to add. Mm -hmm. But I think I have to be realistic on this show and tell you if, if, it can, if the AI tool can go from 50 to 80, it will probably go to 90, 95, and 99. At some point, the human cannot add any more value. Mm -hmm. It's going to be like, okay, I can, uh, you know, I can spend uh, five years and maybe save one more life the marginal benefit of the user will be diminishing because the AI tool will get so good with more data. Mm -hmm. That might be 30 years away, but that day will come. So I think the, the simple one plus one equals three t human machine symbiotic do better quantitatively is a optimistic scenario for the long term. Not mm -hmm. probably not going to be ha happening. However, but I do think the following scenario will be realistic. What is it? The doctor will be more of a human-to-human -human, um, compassion um, connector. So the tool will largely be good enough 
and the human cannot they do a better job in terms of the diagnosis. Right. But maybe the tool will say, will come out with specific numbers. Do these tests, after the test, determine uh, here is a fourth stage lymphoma with a 70% chance of dying in five years, right. within five years. But the doctor won't be the code pronouncer of that death sentence to the, to the patient. The doctor instead will talk to the patient and say, well, you know, there's this guy, Kai Fu Li, he had the same kind of lymphoma, he fought it, he took this chemotherapy, and that's what I'm going to prescribe for you. I think if you keep up, you should have a shot just like he did, hmm. right? That kind of giver of confidence, listening to the patient, maybe visiting the patient at home, hmm. always taking a call when the patient calls, which our doctors currently probably cannot do, uh, will actually create more doctor's jobs than there are today. Mm. But the job is different. It's not an end-to-end -end diagnosis and human interface. It's just the interface. But what if? There is always a what if. Yeah. As things change, as you said, it is quantitative and yet things could change dramatically once it reaches a certain level. So what if AI takes on life of its own? Is right. there a possibility? Uh, you have to ask that question, the dysto dystopia question. Uh, one cannot rule out that possibility, uh, but one and can... one cannot rule out whether AI could in the future develop its own emotions. Uh, one cannot rule that out. Yeah. But we also can't rule out that one day we could fly or rule out that, you know... We couldn't. Uh, yeah, uh, biological warfare destroys mankind. Anything is possible. This is possible. But it's not possible to extrapolate from the engineering algorithms today to say, oh, I'll develop it and one day that will happen. In my mind, I can see engineering algorithms improving cancer detection, diagnosis, right. and um, um, uh, improving to a level way beyond human in the next 20, 30 years. I think it's almost a certainty. Uh, I can just imagine the types of um, algorithms that we already have, plus more data, plus more algorithms, and so on, with no breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. um, but the emotion, the love, the self-replication, uh, taking a mind of its own, right. self-awareness, control human, that's all still just in our imagination. It's not based on any solid scientific uh, evidence. So I, I wouldn't worry too much about it. It's possible, but it's, uh, it's, there's, it's, there's no way to connect the dots at this point. Mm. So I would probably delay that debate and focus more on the real problems of empl employment and education, things right. like that. But you see, Kai Fu, with your experience in the tech world, mm -hmm. you see a trend of new technologies being applied for 20 or 30 years before another new trend comes in and mm. takes its place. Yeah. Earlier we have the social media, which is still going on right now. We right. are using the best benefits of it. Yeah. Uh, and well, at the same time, AI is already coming. Right. So, one would argue, you know, even if there is AI, whether we will be able to develop its full potential mm -hmm. to what extent before the next trend takes its place mm -hmm. is an interesting question, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I think there will be multiple trends and they will happen at the same time faster than ever before. Exactly, I because think, of AI. Uh, and related to it, mm -hmm. and not, uh, not only because of it. For example, I think virtual reality, augmented okay. reality, uh, Internet of Things, mm. wearable computing, uh, those things will all emerge and they'll be related to AI but a little bit different, but they'll reinforce each other. Right. So we're going to be really see this, be seeing multiple tech revolutions hitting us simultaneously mm. and mutually reinforcing. This will be, you know, in the next 10 years, it will be more than the entire, you know, human history. That's true. What about for you, finally? I mean, all of this exciting development, while you are being an advocate of AI, you even write a book recently about it, yes. and talking about it all over the world, you're being quoted widely. There's a lot of danger in that. Uh, <laughs> in terms yes. of, uh, are you betting on the right thing? Yeah, well, I, I'm actually generally pretty cautious <laughs> and pretty accurate. So if you go back at my track record, I think it's pretty decent, you know. I predicted the um, mobile phones and Android in, in uh, 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2011, on the, on the worldwide media, I predicted that Chinese people will stop paying cash and start using their phones, mm -hmm. even though there wasn't even WeChat. So I think there's good reasons to uh, 
listen to me when I make a prediction. <laughs> I will listen to you, Kai Fu. I'm looking forward to future discussions with you about all the latest developments. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, Kai Fu. Thank you. All the best. Thanks. That's Kai Fu Li, founder of Sinovation Ventures and author of the book Artificial Intelligence. It's becoming very popular here in China. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us, World Insights, CGTN, into your search engine, or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Cinewebo. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Insight team, thanks for watching. Tune in again next time for Insights across China and around the world. Good night.